Thank you so much, Elisa, and welcoming me here and for this great uh, generous opportunity. And thanks for the East Asian National Resource Center. Uh, I'm grateful to be here. I would now share my screen. Okay, everything okay? Yes, if if not, please let me know. So, Iran um, Karapte, that's the owner greeting, means the hello or in English, or let me touch your heart. Uh, that is a translation of um, by the Kayano Shigeru, Shigeru Kayano, who was the last Ainu speaker uh, in the Ainu community. He passed away, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay. As uh, Lisa-san introduced, I'm assistant professor at the Hokkaido University of Japan, and as well as associate researcher at the Culture Muse uh, Museum of Culture History, University of Oslo here in Norway. I'm at the moment um, in Norway. So a little bit about myself, as uh, Lisa-san has uh, introduced, I am um, a Ainu scholar and artist and activist who work with a contemporary expression of Ainu culture and people in an artistic form on global platform. For example, I discussed the Ainu representation of Japan's colonial history in a museum and public spaces. What I'm trying to do uh, in the past couple of years is to bring in uh, voices and more of a living life to the object stored in the museum, uh, which is, uh, uh, I would come back to that later. Um, and also here, if you're interested in some of my work, um, there is a, black, a blog published by Museum New Zealand, Te Papa Museum, a National Museum. There here you can, you can look at my short uh, article. And I also have my own website together with my colleagues. It's called I Know Today that has uh, three sections, one scholarship, advocacy, and art. In the scholarship section, uh, we, we created a list of a publication categorized by uh, themes uh, from history, culture, art, community, identity, UN documents, and etc. So one can easily find um, uh, relevant information in English, both in English and Japanese. And advocacy section introduces some of the cultural revitalization work, uh, YouTuber, um, Aina Youth, who is a YouTuber, uh, Maya-san, Sekine. Uh, she, she broadcast Aina language um, channel, which is quite, quite interesting and quite fun. In the last uh, section, art, art section introduces uh, some of my work and uh, other artists' work. The reason why I created this uh, global platform is because there has been uh, quite a lack of um, Ainu voices in the academia or in, in, in everywhere, in fact. And I have received, I'm one of the few um, English speaker in the Ainu community, uh, probably among those who identify ourselves as Ainu and who are from Japan, that's what I'm referring to. Probably we have maybe five person who, who speak uh, English. So I received many questions over the years and I wasn't able to um, uh, respond to all the, the need and, and uh, questions. So then I thought, why not? It was also in the a pan uh, pandemic period. So then I said, why not to create those online platform where we can all access to the information for free. So that's why I created this website. So if you are interested in Ainu topic, please uh, take a look at it. So today's topic is uh, self in 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 sorry, self introduction, uh, who I am, where I come from, what is my family background. And who are Ainu? Uh, as I assume many of you have never heard of Ainu people and culture. And also what makes us Ainu? And then lastly, I will talk and introduce some of my um, uh, art related work, which is museum work. 
Um, and then in lastly, uh, I will show you the trailer for my last uh, artistic art video produced in 2023. So this is a map of Hokkaido. Hokkaido is uh, the main island in Japan, the northern island, uh, located northern island of Japan, uh, where Ainu people are from, and snuggle between Russian tundra and warm Pacific Ocean, which creates the quite unique and diverse, rich, um, and also sensitive climate and the flora and the fauna that has influenced the formation of, for example, Ainu performing art, dances and, and songs are um, inspired and created based on the on the sound of the birds or movement of animal and natures and etc. That, that was, uh, that's the same with um, like Ainu designs, for example, patterns on the kimono, Ainu kimono. So that's quite, uh, I think it's quite interesting to explore. Uh, so I circled um, uh, the place where it's called the Nibutani, where my family comes from, my mother's side. My father is actually Japanese. So Nibutani area, it's believed to be more than 80% of the population residents have Ainu heritage. And this is a place, one of the place I consider as a home. So this is how it looks like. And it's an Ainu house. This is a repro reproduction. Uh, so where we have ceremony sometimes, sometimes Ainu wedding uh, inside you. This is this is how it looks like inside. And the, in the middle, we have a fireplace and the window um, where the god is. This is a passage to the god Kamui also. And then let's see, this is uh, my uh, family picture from, it was taken in the beginning of 20th century. Uh, the um, elderly man and women, they are my great, Great grandparents, Uesanashi and Monumpano. Uesanashi was known to be, or is known to be, the the one of the the skilled, the most skilled Aino sculptor this time, and one of those who started to sell his uh, work to collectors. So I heard that one of his work is stored in Rome and uh, elsewhere, I think. So when I do my uh, museum work, I always uh, look for his work. Um, but these one are uh, ita, a tray by Uesanashi. These are um, still used and and uh, still used in my family in Hokkaido. So who are I know then? Uh, this is my uncle, by the way, doing a carving. Um, Ainu are indigenous people of northern Japan, as I said, traditionally occupying the geographic area, incorporating Kulin Island, Southern Sahelin, and Hokkaido, and part of northern Honshu as well. We traditionally practice hunting. We hunted the uh, uh, deer, and bear, uh, that's for mainly for the it's a mount, we consider bear as a mountain god, so we um, hunted a bear only for uh, special occasions, uh, for ceremon ceremonial purposes. But we eat a uh, deer and fish, salmon. Salmon is our staple food, so and we use all, all parts of salmon skin. We make uh, uh, shoes out of the skin, uh, filet, of course, we eat that, and bones and the head can be used also um, as I want the uh, dish uh, or make a soup out of that. Foraging wild plants is quite an important part of the Ainu culture even now. So this is a woman's role to go to the mountain to gather uh, wild plants and medicinal plants as well. So that's considered to be uh, Ainu traditional knowledge. And also this, um, as you can imagine, this uh, foraging wild plant is a place where uh, we pass on the, the traditional knowledge to the younger generation. So it's quite important um, cultural practice. 
So criteria, one may wonder, uh, this is a quote, a translation of the criteria listed in the Hokkaido Ainu Living Condition Survey in 2017. So there are three of them. So they say individuals who are considered to have Ainu bloodline in their communities, two, those who identify themselves as Ainu, and then lastly, those who reside with Ainu due to marriage as well as adoption. So now you see uh, there can be uh, lots of uh, um, potential challenges in this criteria. And uh, since we don't have national survey, uh, ethnic national survey in Japan, it's uh, it's quite difficult to, to define who is Ainu or who is not. But in Japan, we have a family registry. So if you have family registry, you, you see the uh, name of your ancest ancestors. Uh, and then it, you, in that way, we can recognize Ainu uh, ancestry. So, however, it's important that the one identify oneself as Ainu person. So if one doesn't do it, of course, the person is not, one is not considered to be Ainu. And also collective recognition is, this is my observation or understanding um, is that collective recognition It's quite important. It's a quite small community. So we kind of know each other quite well. Uh, and also a common question is, you know, who is, who, who is your, who are your parents? Who are your grandparents and so forth? Because um, I know are known to be a people who are, uh, who have a good memories. We don't have, we, we don't have letters. So we, uh, it's an oral, all our language so which means that we must have a good memory to remember all the all the things so my aunt used to say that we used to remember our relatives uh, names that goes back maybe 120 years and so forth so it's uh it's quite remarkable i think if i think about it from the modern context modern perspective at least for myself and also one Preferably, you should have connection to the communities. And having said that, of course, there is uh, many people who don't have connection to communities because of the different reasons, migration, um, uh, work, uh, marriage, and, and et cetera. Or one decides to not to have a connection to the, the Ainu community because of discrimination or et cetera, et cetera. So it's all depending on uh, it's case by case. And also this Hokkaido Ainu Living Condition Survey, which is, this is the latest uh, number uh, statistic, which, which is also quite old, 2017, only covers Hokkaido Island. So those who live outside of Hokkaido are not included in, 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 the, in here, which is this number here. Uh, it's the same survey. Uh, it's it and then 2017 it shows 13,118 individual, which was a, a decline of nearly 45 percent in Ainu population compared to the 23,782 individual recorded in the 2006 survey. So why is it? Uh, we believe that people, many people, um. Uh, are more relaxed and to reveal the identity. Nowadays, we use a lot of social media and sometimes one can get uh, attacked or uh, yeah, so-called hate speech. Um, that's one of the, that has been uh, the discussion or problem at least uh, that we have been facing. So that can be one of the reason also. And also, once again, this only covers Hokkaido. So those who are living outside of Hokkaido are not part of this survey. So we assume that probably 25 Ainu population is between 25 to 50,000 uh, in Japan. And as I say, Japan doesn't collect the data on ethnicity in national census. So a little bit very brief. 
uh, history of of uh, political and political and legal landscape of Ainu. Hokkaido was annexed by Japanese government in 1869. Assimilation was forced upon the since 1899 by Hokkaido former Aborigines Protection Act. As you may know, Japan was closed under Edo era for 265 years. Um, Japan locked the country, locked the country, uh, um, opened finally the country to the West by Meiji restoration in 1868. So then around that time, I know considered as the other by Japanese and foreigners. I will come back to that later. Japan imported a theory of race and social Darwinism, which made the Ainu fascinating research subject in the world, which explains larger collections of the, on the Ainu in the United States and elsewhere, especially Russia and Germany. In 2007, Japanese government voted in favor of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, known as UNDRIP. In the following year, I believe because of the pressure, and we also had a G8 summit around that time. So Japan were, in a way, um, forced to recognize, forced or uh, it was inevitable not to recognize, I would say. So in 2008, Japan, Japanese government recognized the Ainu as indigenous to the land of Hokkaido. However, it wasn't legal binding resolution, meaning that you say, okay, you are indigenous to the land of Hokkaido, but in fact, we don't give you the rights as indigenous people, indigenous rights, so-called. So there was a lot of complaint from the Ainu community. This continued until uh, 2019, and then finally Ainu are for the first time in history recognized in the Japanese legislation as indigenous people of Japan. And then this is a little bit easier to, to look at. So it goes like this. Hokkaido Form Aboriginal Act continue around 100 years until 1997, it's, which is quite remarkable, I think, uh, that this, this um, Hokkaido Form Aboriginal Protection Act was continued until 1997. And in 1997, Cultural Promotion Act that we that was also heavily criticized because this only covered the promotion of culture and language, nothing else. And we argue that to be able to practice language and culture, we need to have a right. We need to have a right to the land, uh, um, to the also to the to the fishing, to the natural resources, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a uh, time, historical timeline and name of those laws. Okay, so cultural revitalization. How do we talk about it? That's, that's uh, my question actually, uh, to myself as well. What's cultural revitalization? I mean, for me, cultural revitalization can be talked in so many ways. Of course, uh, uh, language revitalization, as is, as I said, we don't have uh, any more uh, native speaker of Ainu language left. So we are depending on the tapes, uh, DVD, all this uh, uh, old uh, recorded material revitalize the language. And it, this effort has been uh, active in the last maybe 30, 30 years, maybe 40 years. So there are now people, even though they are not a native speaker of the Ainu language, but quite fluent in the language and even teach Ainu language to the younger generations. And many schools, especially high school and universities, you can take language classes. Mm, one may think it's probably more language classes than the classes on the culture. I don't know exactly why, uh, but it, it is like that. And also we have in Hokkaido, we have about 17 
uh, Aino Culture uh, Preservation Association, which is part of uh, run by operated by the um, Aino Association of Hokkaido, which is the largest Aino Association. Um, so they practice uh, performing arts um, and going around festival schools to promote Aino culture um, in general. So let's talk about these pictures that I talked about the salmon. So they are making chitatap. That chitatap is Aino language, which means minced, minced meat, can be minced fish too. So we are chopping this, uh, it's a salmon, and uh, uh, making this chitatap uh, with simply using salt. And then in the middle picture, this plant, it's the uh, cattail. Um, this is uh, called gamma in, the, in Japanese. It becomes this mat in the middle. So this mat is made out of this cattail, which is quite amazing. I think it's a long process. And um, my aunt still practice that and makes this beautiful mat. This is our family uh, mat that we have at home. And to the to the right. Now this is a carving. I know uh, a car I know pattern uh, carved in the different forms and shape. And this is more of a contemporary style, I would say. And uh, this is it's it started to visualize their cultural expression in a public space like this. So it's quite nice to, to see. This is in, in Nibutani, by the way. But even Sapporo Station in Hokkaido, for example, there are many display of Ainu uh, kimono or even animations and uh, uh, sculpt sculpture and, and et cetera. So it's, it's kind of a visual um, uh, presence is quite, quite uh, active nowadays. And on the right top, that's myself and my kimono um, made by my aunt. This is embroidery culture, which, which is still actively practiced in the community and even in cities. You can, there's instructors, so you can always go and learn the embroidery. And open for both, for anybody who wishes to take the class, not only for the Ainu people. So for um, uh, Japanese people or um, foreigners or whoever who wish to, to learn the Aino culture, it's always welcome to do so. So now I'm moving on to uh, the last, uh, last um, topic, which is uh, my uh, current um, work. I know art exhibition that I am um, working on and with the collaboration of um, University of Michigan Museum of Art. So we are three women, uh, myself as a guest and main creator, and also Dr. Natsu Oyobe. She is um, a creator specializing on uh, Asian art. And then Susan Dine, she is also specializing in uh, Japanese art and now teaches uh, some of the Aino culture. So they saw how I came to, to be invited to this project. It's, um, it started with a question of question that they, it was raised by them in 2021, I think. They, they saw my presentation at um, another I know exhibition in Germany, in Cologne. Oh, it was online lecture. And then they contacted me and asked if I had a chance to, to create exhibition, art exhibition, what would you like to do? And then I said, I would like to create exhibition that represent Ainu voices, especially women, because we have been, um, all the exhibitions that I have seen, because I know the effort Ainu women put into making, kimono and even food and etc. I don't get to see any of those uh, narratives in the display of Aino exhibitions. Unfortunately, it's it's a uh, heavily focused on hunting or 
um, curbings and, and often just the name of the place and the name of the person, the maker. And uh, I would like to change that. That's what I said. So that's the beginning. Yes. So this is a little bit of um, uh, explanation about the exhibition. So this exhibition present contemporary Ainu Ayn art in a dialogue with the past representation by and of Ainu people and culture from historical North American collection with specific focus on Ainu women, which is the first exhibition in the US to foreground Ainu women's voices. So through robust community-based art making and programs by in-person and digital platform, the exhibition seeks to connect museum and Ainu communities. The exhibition will uh, comprise four sections, which are thematically and organically connected introdu introduction. Introduction, land connection, relationality, and togetherness. So in this exhibition, I would like to, or we would like to focus on food making also and traditional knowledge in the food making and artists could, could um, create something based on that. And also uh, togetherness. Togetherness is where it shows the, the connection and the relationship between uh, Wajin, Wajin as a Japanese people and Ainu. Because we should not disregard Japanese people who, who also um, live together and work together. And also relationality as connection to the past historical collection stored in the museum, in this case, the, the Ainu collection in the United States. So again, why do we focus on Ainu women? Because simply Ainu women have not been focused in the, in the, of the museum exhibitions. And also it is to enrich and challenge our understanding of indigenous art. As you may know, this year, uh, Jeffrey Gibson, uh, who is uh, consider himself as uh, American, but he is also a Cherokee, is uh, representing the uh, United States at the um, uh, Venice Biennale. So this is something emerging and exciting and, and I see it as very, um, uh, yeah, from, from that perspective, I, I see it very ex exciting time. And it is also to tell rich story embedded within Ainu material culture. There are so much to, to tell from one kimono making, for example, from you know, sketching the design of kimono to, to each person has uniquely uh, has their own imagination, inspiration from nature, animal, or can be from the kimono that she or he had before, thinking about a person who is going to wear, you know, which color they would like to, you know, how they, you know, practical, practical side of it as well. So there, and then it's also collective things too. When you make a kimono, you get together, you have teacher, you, it takes a several months to make one kimono. And then in that journey, I would call it. And then there's a lot of things happening in the process, talking to the teacher, imagining the design, sketching it, making mistakes and doing embroidery. And so imagine how much effort can be put into this one kimono. So um, also I want to make a point that different social structure we have, I, know, I think this is my personal view, but I do not have a patriarchal society. This is to challenge our understanding on gender role in modern society, which is quite different from Japanese culture, I would say. Women have very important role and it is just a division of the work. So this is, uh, <clears throat> Uh, in the 90s, uh, Professor Kotani Yoshinobu, uh, he is from the Q I think he's from the Kyushu University then, that time. He and his colleague went to the United States and um, 
did a research on the Aino collection, and, now, and this is the data from that time. It's quite old. But based on this, uh, actually last month I was in the US and Canada, uh, visited eight museums. Uh, I uh, marked it here. Uh, so Royal Ontario Museum, for example, has 75 objects. And Brooklyn has 950. American Museum of Natural History in New York, 450. National Museum of Natural History, Washington, D.C. has 214. University of Michigan Museum of Art, six objects, and etc. What was very interesting for me when I look at this and talking to those creators uh, is that in Canada, it, it um, the Ontario Royal Ontario Museum consider the object as a living object or belongings. And they ask me if I want to um, have a ceremony or do something with them if I wish to do so, or private time. And I was quite taken by that uh, happily and appreciated very much that they put so much care and respect towards, uh, towards the, these objects. Not that all the other uh, creators uh, in, in the museum in the US didn't have it, they did have it, but it was just a different way of um, communicating. Communication was, was different. So, the picture. Uh, oh yeah, collectors, yes. So collectors is uh, quite an uh, interesting story. We just began research, so I can only tell a little bit about it is that let's look into Brooklyn Museum. Uh, Stuart Culling, he was a creator, first in, at Penn Museum, Penn Museum, I think, and they moved to Brooklyn Museum. And he was a creator. And I got a lot of things from Frederick Starr. Uh, he, I think he went to Japan the beginning of 20th century, three times, three or four times. And he also organized the World's uh, Fair in 1904, Saint, Saint Louis Ainu Pavilion. So which, you know, this word fair, in other words, people say human pavilion, right? So uh, it's, it's, um, it can be, or it is heavily criticized for, for, this too as well. But anyway, Frederick Starr organized Aino Pavilion and with a connection, with the help of this John Bachelor, who lived in Japan over 60 years. Um, he was a British missionary. He helped all those collectors, foreign collectors. So through John Bachelor, Frederick Starr had access to the community, which is my community, Nibutani included. So he uh, purchased uh, quite a bit of uh, objects from that region, Hokkaido. This is one of uh, things that uh, Frederick Starr got it from John Bachelor. I don't know how he he managed to get this beautiful, this is a child, children kimono, a beautiful kimono, because I see this as, as a product of love and respect, how how delicately designed and thought through, and you know, you even use a colored, uh, colored uh, cotton. Um, um, it, they use the color, which is red. Uh, it must be expensive that time, I assume, and also it's it's a very beautiful work done. I just can't imagine the mother or grandmother. Uh, this is a woman's work, right, to do, to make a kimono. So I'm just saying grandmother or mother who made this kimono thinking of grandchildren or, or their, their children uh, must be sad to, to give this away. I would, I would never be able to do that. So, and this is um, in Asian section, they had the uh, Ainu, Ainu display, Ainu collection display. So what I did was to visit all this museum, looking at Aino collections, if there are anything interesting object that has, that, looking at the object that has interesting story behind 
and then can use it in the our exhibition with the Michigan Museum. So I also had a side project, which is to create an indigenous presence in such a museum, because in this museum kind of represent the colonial history. How can I tell that story narratives from my perspective? My way of doing it is to dance with object, for example, or to take a pictures or portrait with object. I will show you some of this work, like this, for example. This is a Brooklyn Museum. And this, the last project I did in 2023 is to produce an art video together with uh, Italian documentary photographer, Laura Liverani. She produced another Ainu film uh, before, but we worked together on the Ainu collection stored in the, um, in the museum in Oslo, cultural history, the museum or cultural history. They had 27 objects. So we met for the first time, actually. We, we collaborated in another exhibition in Germany, but uh, we met in person for, for the first time in Oslo, 2023, and did filming for one week. Look at, looked at the object, how we can um, tell uh, my narratives and how can I give life back to those objects? Purchased, collected by collectors. And most of them collected very few information on this. This is a picture of all Ainu E, we call it, description Ainu people and culture in the late uh, 19th century. Yes, so what makes us Ainu is, is uh, uh, to be myself and to be, to, be, uh, to be honest with myself and my way of doing is to create my own expression through Ainu art. So, oh, sorry. Thank you very much, Iairaikere. And uh, this is also the, the my website link. And Lisa San, which can show you the trailer for the Ainupuni art film after this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that absolutely fascinating discussion. Um, let me pull up um, screen share and And hopefully this will work okay.
over to Patrick and his discussion of UQ Islands languages. Thank you very much. Let me first uh, share the screen, everyone. I assume you can see uh, the screen now. Uh, hi, everyone. Patrick Heinrich, and I'm joining you. I'm going to be a little so my name is Patrick Heinrich. I'm um, glad to see everyone. I'm obviously not Okinawan, but I'm German. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be talking to you, especially after this uh, very interesting talk uh, by my uh, colleague, uh, Professor um, Uzawa. Um, I'm grateful to uh, GWU for organizing this um, talk. And uh, I'll be taking you to the South uh, western end of uh, the Japanese archipelago, namely to the Ryukyuan Islands, where we find uh, more uh, diversity, uh, diversity linguistic, which is uh, my field of work, but it's also cultural and spiritual. Um, they are diverse. So, for everybody uh, interested in non linguistic issues uh, uh, within Japan. Um, I will address uh, three larger topics um, in my talk today. So we'll first talk about uh, language diversity in the Ryukyus to give everyone about the diversity, its origin, and um, how diversity is um, faring there. I will then point out to research that is uh, largely done by um, friends and colleagues um, of mine in, um, in the Ryukyus, namely on uh, new speakers. And I will conclude with some of my more recent research, namely on the nexus of language and well-being um, in um, So this is uh, how it looks like. Uh, Japan, you see uh, a map here, and this map is taken from the UNESCO Atlas of the World's Languages uh, in Danger of Disappearance. Uh, you will see up uh, in the north, of course, um, Ainu language, uh, which is endangered. You see uh, below Tokyo, that is uh, Hachijo language. I will talk very briefly about this on the next slide. And then you will see uh, six endangered uh, Rukyun languages, which are from north to south, uh, Amami, then Kunigami, Okinawa, Miyako, Yayama, and Yonago. Um, these uh, languages do not allow for mutual um, comprehensibility, intelligibility with Japanese and uh, also between themselves. Um, so you cannot speak in the Yonaguni language to somebody from, let's say, Okinawa or from Miyako. Um, it's very interesting or important for everyone who um, uh, studies or hears the first time about Yukyun languages, that this is not some sort of Okinawa ban. So some Okinawan dialects um, languages are very, very different from um, Japanese, also they are related. And there is huge diversity between them. So you see that on the right hand side of uh, this slide. So in um, the Amami archipelago, you have more than 250 local dialects. So 250 dialects of the Amamian language. Uh, 400 in uh, Okinawa and the surrounding um, islands. In Miyako, you have 70, in Yayama, 20, 25, and in Yonaguni, one. Uh, so um, that is to say that um, descriptive linguists in Japan have uh, worked and identified more than 700 local varieties or what we call dialects, right? But remember, these are dialects of Rikun languages. This is not a dialect of Japanese, so it's not an epiphenomenon of Japanese. It's not something Japanese, but slightly different. But these are systems in their own right. So if you were, for instance, to translate something uh, from the Miyako language into English, uh, a Japanese dictionary and grammar would be of no help. You would need a Miyako grammar and a Miyako dictionary. So this is um, <clears throat> what we call these uh, languages. 
Okay, uh, we call this, this is a bit of uh, linguistic jargon, we call them upstand languages, so languages by distance, because they have distant uh, and, and distinct linguistic systems, and we call them unroofed because they do not have a standard language. That is to say, Okinawan is not unified by some kind of standard Okinawan, but all that you find there are uh, local varieties. So dialects, um, and in some of the islands, there are always um, the main settlement, the biggest settlement, um, sort of sometimes assumes something like a standard function, um, but uh, standard languages require writing, and Ryukyuan languages um, are usually not written but spoken. Okay, so if we look at this then from a genealogical uh, perspective, I'll be very brief on that uh, be um, below my uh, slides. Um, I should actually hold on uh, to here. Um, <clears throat> underneath the slides, you always find uh, literature and the reference to the real experts, right? So this I'm uh, reporting here, uh, the, the expert on this is uh, Thomas Pellar, who works on um, the historical relations between um, Rukyun languages, uh, Japanese and Hachijo. So what we do have in the Japanese archipelago is uh, a language family, uh, which is called the Japonic language family. And it involves three main branches. So uh, Japanese, which is the largest language, uh, Hachijo, which is, uh, you remember the, the slide, it's uh, spoken uh, to the in the south um, east of uh, Tokyo on Hachijo Island, and then Rukyuan, uh, which uh, has most languages, namely altogether six. We usually distinguish between uh, two branches in Rukyuan, namely southern Rukyuan and northern Rukyuan. And everybody who works in descriptive linguistics usually focuses on one of the two branches because they um, are between themselves quite different. And then in the south, you have the three languages I mentioned before, Yonaguni, Yayama, and Miyako. And in the north, you'd have Okinawa, Kunigami, Amami. So how did these languages um, emerge? Uh, we know today that uh, the Japonic languages used to be spoken on the continent um, and the Korean peninsula. And we call them then the uh, um, continental proto-Japonic. Um, and that Japonic language speakers moved uh, into the Japanese archipelago through Kyushu. Um, and that is where Proto-Japonic was spoken in that gradually moved up uh, northeast, the Japanese main islands. And um, in the fifth and sixth century, then uh, all Japanese um, emerged uh, around the Kinki region, right, Naha, Nara, Kyoto. Um, and this old Japanese then spread across uh, the Japanese archipelagos. We have two waves, right? We have proto-Japanese moving from Kyushu up north. And then we have old Japanese from the, what is today, Osaka, Kinki uh, region, then spreading back again into the south. And when old Japanese reaches Kyushu, the proto-Japonic languages moves into the Rukyun languages, into the Rukyu islands and the Rukyun languages emerge. So the Rikun languages are both new and old. They're old in the way that they um, um, developed from the oldest strata of the Japonic languages, and they're new because Rikuns moved into the Rikyu Islands at some point around the 10th century. Okay, so so much on that background. Read uh, Thomas Pilar if you're uh, more interested in these issues. Um, have a, let's have a look at it geographically. Uh, geography is always very um, interesting and it explains uh, many things. So um, here you see again a map of uh, the Japanese archipelago. Um, all the dots are endangered languages. Um, with regards to Ainu, we usually distinguish between Sakhalin, Kuril, and uh, Hokkaido Ainu. These two are upstand languages, that is, languages by distance um, also related. So the Ainu of the Kuril Islands uh, is very distinct from what we find in Hokkaido and so on. Um, you'd find uh, here Hatijo, which I talked about, right, which is the eastern branch of uh, Japonic language. So people moved into Hachijo uh, before all Japanese um, reached them. So this too is 
old and new at the same time, like the Rikyun languages. This is um, Okazawara Islands, right, or Bonin Islands, where uh, Creole English was spoken um, in the past, um, endangered um, today. And then you have the six uh, Rikyun languages. So you see that they are all in the uh, geographical periphery of um, Japan, of the Japanese archipelago. And that is um, no surprise. This is a pattern that we find in all modern nation states. So if you study endangered languages, you always end up in some sort of periphery on islands. Um, and um, the reason for this is um, quite simple. So you see underneath I uh, inserted um, horizontal um, arrow. So this is how, how language functions, right? Because um, you need to communicate uh, with people in order that language is similar. And the further you go away, the further you move away from where you are, language will get increasingly different. Right, that is that is um, a normal pattern that we find throughout the world. So you have this horizontal organization of uh, language diversity, but this all changes in modernity because in modernity you create uh, borders where there used to be frontiers, and you define uh, with borders where Japan uh, starts and where Japan ends, and then you imagine um, the Japanese people. Or, any nation as linguistically, culturally uh, unified. And uh, with that new organization um, in your head, it's an idea, right? Uh, in your head, uh, all of a sudden linguistic diversity becomes different, right? No longer horizontal, it becomes uh, vertical. It becomes hierarchical with the dominant language. So the language with most speakers, the language of those who held who uh, have power um, on top and everything else, the more distant it gets, the lower in the hierarchy it is. And it is this which uh, has led to language endangerment around the world. So instead of saying, well, we move away from the center of power, which is Tokyo modernity, into the north, into, um, into Hokkaido, the Kurila and Shakalin, and saying, of course, language is different there. Of course, culture is different there. Of course, um, people are different there. Since you have imagined them as Japanese nationals, that diversity all of a sudden is seen as a problem. And the more you diverge, the more problematic it is, right? So it's, an, it's a problem of ideas, right? And modernity has done a lot of um, damage um, in that. I've written a book about that. It's called The Making of Monolingual Japan. So if you're interested in that, uh, have a look at this book. So um, <clears throat> let us then see how diversity fares in a, modern, uh, in a modern configuration. It does not fare well, as we know, because um, there's endangered languages around the world. And they're always endangered by um, national languages. So they're not endangered by globalization or by the advancement of English. If um, young Ainu no longer speak um, Ainu today, it's not because their family have started speaking English, right? Because their families have started to speak Japanese. And that's the same in the Ryukyu Islands. So the nation state is the enemy of minority, um, not globalization. Globalization can help minorities because they can connect and they can talk um, and they can collaborate, as we saw in the important uh, work of uh, Professor Uzawa. So, for instance, in the Ryukyu Islands, we find uh, the practice of the Hogen Fuda, which you find on the right hand side. It's usually translated as dialect tag. So, this is a tag that pupils in Okinawa had to uh, carry around their neck when they used Okinawan. Uh, it was a form of um, punishment, it was meant to embarrass them. Um, and the pupil in charge of the who had to wear the dialect tag because he had failed to speak adequately uh, Japanese, was then in charge of passing it on to uh, his or her classmates. So uh, pupils were monitoring each other. Uh, and of course, that's a terrible way to, to learn and to interact. And we know from the important research uh, by my colleague and friend Kondo Kinichiro um, that uh, classrooms in Okinawa were not very active uh, for that reason, because pupils were simply afraid to talk. And you also see on the backside of the Hogan Fuda uh, that it's written Konofuda o Nakushita uh, Monowa um, Umoibatsu Atairu. 
So the person who loses this dialect right will be punished severely. Um, many things led to a uh, language shift um, in the Ryukyu Islands. Uh, the Hokan Futa is one of them. So language shift means that you use another language in place of the ancestral language. Um, the result, of course, is that few and fewer people speak the language, that there's few and fewer situations, we call them domains, where you can speak um, the language. And on the left is um, an overview where you see uh, the decrease in number of full speakers of um, Okinawan. So uh, the, the situation is uh, much better than uh, in uh, Hokkaido with um, the Ainu because the Okinawans uh, maintained, uh, remained a minority, a majority in the Ryukyu Islands, whereas the, the Ainu were, of course, quickly outnumbered. Uh, by Japanese settlers, and there were also uh, fewer, so it was much more difficult for them to be resilient and to maintain um, their language and culture. So, but not all is uh, doom and gloom. Uh, the Ainu are around, their language is around, uh, people speak it as a second language, the number of Ainu speakers is actually increasing, and um, we have uh, similar uh, developments in the Ryukyu Islands where we find around 100 new speakers um, of the eye of uh, Rukun language today. So we have a constantly but slowly growing number of um, new speaker and that gives of course hope that uh, Okinawan language uh, will be uh, maintained. So then let's have a look at new speakers of uh, Rukun languages. Um, being a new speaker is um, quite difficult so many of you uh, will study uh, foreign languages, right? You will study Asian languages or maybe, you know, other languages, Spanish that you learned in school or something like that. And if you remember, that's difficult enough, learning a language and starting to speak it. If you're a new speaker of an endangered language, it's even more difficult um, because um, they usually have no history of being taught as a second language or as a foreign language. So all Ainu speakers until you know, let's say the 1960s were native speakers, all Rukun speakers until very, very recently were native speakers. So while you all deal with my German accent when I talk with you, having an accent in an endangered language is something which has never happened. And so people might react um, very strongly against it and says, well, if you speak like that, it's better if we speak, you know, Japanese, for instance. So the interruption of language uh, transmission leads to new variations so people are not as fluent or people learn it again and very often there's a purist language reaction to that um, that they say well you know if you don't speak correctly if you don't speak like a native speaker if you're not a full speaker what is the whole point right so um, one is much more severe to endangered languages than to foreign languages like English also you know Japanese uh, Mandarin Korean and so on so that is um, a problem that um, new speakers um, have to face. Um, I have conducted some research um, in this topic with a former graduate student of mine, with uh, Julia Valsecki, um, and uh, we interviewed um, some new speakers and I read you some excerpts of what they report. Uh, so here we have, uh, so uh, OJF20 means Okinawan Japanese female uh, in her 20s. So she told us um, studying Rukun totally matches what I'm looking for. This makes me really happy that I'm following my own goals. In a way, it has also liberated me. Maybe I studied English to become American. So she had studied English in school. The same with Japanese. One studies Japanese to become even more Japanese. Okinawan is different. I studied to be myself. So this is, again, something which is very different from uh, foreign language learning, uh, like many Asian languages, but I did not study Japanese to become myself. I studied it, you know, for various reasons, the same with, you know, other foreign languages that I've learned. Or um, underneath we have uh, OJF 40, so and two is just the, the second person in her 40s who is Okinawan, Japanese and female. 
Um, she told us today the Uchinanchu spirit. So Uchinanchu is Okinawan. Uh, the Uchinanchu spirit, the Uchinanchu, the Uchinanchu way of thinking is evaluated, starting from the assumption that Okinawa is in Japan. So that's a problem. Nihono Naka no Okinawa is what she said. As if Okinawa is the countryside of Japan. So she rejects that idea. Okinawa is Okinawa. Okinawa is the center of Okinawa. It's not, you know, the somebody else. If Uchinaguchi was used again in everyday life, we'd be able to think about Okinawa as Okinawa. So Okinawa to no Okinawa o kangeru koto ga dekiru. If we think that we need to match Japanese standards or that we are at the bottom of Japan, right? Remember how all of a sudden variation becomes seen hierarchically. Uh, so if we didn't think at that way, uh, if we focus more on Okinawa, our self-confidence would increase. So learning a new language is you know, a form of liberation. It's a form of self-realization. It's connecting to the past and it's shifting. Uh, the focus away from uh, the nation state back into the region, so back onto the Ryukyus, or, you know, if you would conduct similar um, and, and I knew, I'm sure that people would say that they look at Hokkaido as a cultural linguistic center where the identity um, is based. Um, so uh, some of uh, my friends, I assume, um, there are uh, in Okinawa have started to teach uh, Okinawan uh, to anybody who's interested. And that's where these new speakers are formed. Uh, the most important two people here are uh, a Dutch guy uh, of all people, Gijs van der Lube, and uh, his uh, partner Misato uh, Matsuda. They run uh, Binchukai, so Benkyokai, uh, uh, on two different levels, so beginner level and um, mid-advanced level, um, where they do not teach uh, Okinawan as a standard language, but they try to maintain um, the many uh, varieties that there are there by using a polynomic uh, language model. So you see, it's very interesting if you move um, into the Ryukyus, and probably the same with Hokkaido about so I'm, despite I'm being very interested in it, you'll find that people there do things actually better than on the mainland, right? Instead of imposing whatever prestigious, pretty, beautiful uh, variety of a language, I said any variety is good if you're interested in it and if we can somehow manage to teach it. Uh, so they teach it without a single prestige variety. They wouldn't say, for instance, that the language of Shuri, right? The ancient capital of the Ryukyu kingdom, is the best variety that everybody uh, needs to, to learn. Uh, but rather they teach students also about um, configurations of uh, variation within the language, which is you know, mostly in grammar and also in um, pronunciation and words. Um, that is uh, useful to teach language in that way because uh, traditional speakers of which there are many still, are usually monodialectal. So if you if you are from a specific village in Okinawa, parents uh, speak Okinawan, they will speak the local variety, right? So if you want to engage with them, there is you know no point in learning, for instance, the Shuri variety, but you want to learn how they speak. Um, it also allows them to learn together, so to reconnect to your ancestors, to the region where you come from, to a specific local. Um, identity and also facilitates master apprentice learning, which is also something which is um, now practiced um, in the Ryukyu Island. That is a full speaker looks after two to three uh, new speakers teaching his or her language. So there's also research on that by um, younger uh, colleagues and friends of mine. So Miho Zlasli, uh, who is now at SOAS, but she's from Yomitan village, uh, comes to mind here. Um, uh, Hamine Madoka um, comes to mind here, uh, but also Matt Toppy, who is an American, but uh, runs a master apprentice learning uh, program in uh, Yayama, comes to mind here. So it's hard to be a new student. This is now the, the work of Madoka Hamine, which I mentioned before. Um, she did 
field work in, uh, in two islands, in Okinawa and in Yayama. So this is uh, from her field work in Yayama, um, where she interviews people about, you know, um, their reaction to um, new speakers. And so um, one of the people there uh, told her, uh, you are beautiful. So I don't speak Miyaran Yayama to you. So I don't speak the local. And uh, the second person says, yeah, to an ugly woman, he speaks Miyaran. Yes, for an ugly woman, woman I can speak Miyaran and talk about Miyara, uh, he confirms. And so Madoka asks, so you speak in standard Japanese to a beautiful woman? And he says, yes, to beautiful woman, I have to push myself. And what you see here is a complementary attribution of features to endangered languages, right? If standard Japanese is beautiful and urban and developed and educated and prestigious, then uh, local languages are exactly the different, right? They're not prestigious, they're not beautiful, they're not urban, they're rural. Uh, if the standard language is forward and progressive, then it's regressive and backward and so on and so forth. So these are like images that have been imposed from outside um, on these languages and you see them in the minds of these people. Um, it was uh, very difficult for Madoka to overcome this and uh, she uh, made this particular conversation the central core of her PhD thesis, which uh, she defended in Finland at the University of Lapland. And her thesis is titled, I want to be beautiful and speak my language too. So you see that you need to empower uh, your language and your people. And that again is a, a very nice link, I think, to the talk uh, of Professor um, Usawa um, before. Um, Madoka also um, identified three different patterns, how people react when she speaks as a new speaker to old fluent speakers. So some would discourage her or ignore um, her, they would say, what's the whole point in speaking that? Some would make uh, compliments and say, wow, you know, well done that you are learning this, it's very important, but speak back in Japanese. And very few would reply in the um, endangered language. Um, and one sees here that um, it's not so easy to bring back uh, a language um, because very often, um, um, people have not passed on their language. Um, that's not like some rational choice that they thought, or maybe it's better for, you know, educational purposes, uh, or, you know, it's better for uh, work purposes or whatever. Um, they experience discrimination, stigmatization, very often they're traumatized. So it's not so easy for them to break out of this. And uh, there's another vignette from Madoka's important research where she writes, other grandmas, so one is from Okinawa, one is from Yayama, who is a native speaker of Miyar Yayama, uh, did not finish elementary school. She used to tell me not to speak Miyama to her, but I continue to do so, making many mistakes. My hand and said, thank you for learning Miyaran. Right, so you see that learning um, endangered language is very, very different than learning an Asian language for us, right? It's an emotional roller coaster. Uh, it's involved with, you know, with healing. Uh, it's, uh, it involves uh, overcoming uh, trauma. And this is why we um, now call it uh, language reclamation. So you have to reclaim uh, something other than, you know, language learning. Um, so learning indigenous language involves emotion, it does something to you that, you know, learning English, French, Spanish, Korean, Chinese does not do uh, for us. So that brings me to the next and last topic. So does it affect well-being? And this is um, something that I have been studying in the past two years. Uh, so let me show you um, why I became interested in that. Uh, on the left hand side, you see a table uh, which you find in many economic uh, textbooks. Um, you see here uh, the uh, growth of uh, gross domestic uh, um, product, that is um, income, right? That's the curve that is rising. So you see over the years, people have an increasingly high income, right? Incomes um, have been growing. 
Um, and then you contrast this with uh, results that we have into happiness of people, and you see that they stay, this, that their happiness does not change. So we know from this something very important that is often quoted that money doesn't make you happy, right? Uh, lack of money can make you unhappy, right? That is not the same thing. But once you have um, enough money, you know, to not have to lie awake at night and worry how to pay your bills or whether you can send your children to uh, school, university or not, uh, more money will not make you happy. Um, and that's um, for two reasons. Uh, happiness is relative, right? So relative means that you compare yourself to others, to peers. There's no such absolute standard on which you measure your own happiness. So if you have an income of, let's say, $80,000 per year, and all your friends have $80,000, you're very happy. If uh, in 10 years, all of you and you and your friends will make 100 happiness will be the same. So happiness does not durably uh, affect your happiness. You might be happier for half a year if you get um, a higher income, and then your happiness level goes back to where it was. So if we study uh, language well-being, language and happiness, we are interested in things that impact our happiness durably. And we know uh, various things that impact our happiness durably, health, family, friends, lack of corruption, all of these things make us durably happy. <clears throat> and the question is, is language such a thing? Does language, can language make you durably uh, happier uh, if uh, you are able to learn, if you're able to speak it? Um, I um, had this idea by looking at the table on the right where we see something very, very interesting. Um, this is from uh, a public health um, study uh, where uh, people, uh, medical professors, looked into uh, two things. Namely, first, um, whether people suffered from diabetes. And people here are um, the indigenous people of Canada, so First Nations. And then looked, um, so this would be... Uh, um, uh, they have um, diabetes, yes or not, and the cause, right, or the, the um, independent variable would be, uh, do they know their indigenous language? And as you see here, the less they knew their indigenous language, the more likely they were to have diabetes. Or seen the other way around, the more they knew their language, the less they were prone to have diabetes. So we have here a relation, cause effect between knowing your language and health, right? So why is it that, um, as you know, Oster and his associates find out, how is it that people who maintained their uh, indigenous language um, in Canada uh, were healthier? It obviously had nothing to do with language itself, right? It's not that specific sounds, word or phonemes make you, make you healthy. But language comes together in a set. It comes together with a culture, with an identity, with practice and knowledge. And it's this practice, knowledge, and identity which result in healthier lifestyles. So from this, I had the idea, let us look uh, whether there's a relationship between knowing Okinawan and being happy. Um, in order to do that, I went to Yomitan village, which is, uh, right, this is Okinawa here. So this is the Okinawan language. Uh, it's right on the north of the Okinawan language border. Up north from here, we have the Kunigami language. So I went to uh, Yomitan in 2022, and I uh, collected 1,374 answers to a questionnaire I designed. Uh, research was funded by uh, Kafoska University, and I collaborated there with Yomitan Village, in particular with uh, Seda Machida, who works in the education board. Uh, but there's also other uh, scholars involved there, Yumiko Ohara, uh, Tatsuro Maeda, um, in particular. And then I had two uh, graduate students, uh, PhD postdocs, who assisted me, Julia Valsecki and uh, Lorenzo Nespoli. So this is a collective effort, even so I take uh, all the merits for this research today. So we asked many questions, and this is uh, one of the questions where we, where we said, for instance, uh, can you speak the local language, which uh, is called Shimakutuba, 
Shima is a community in Okinawan, it's not island. So I speak Shima Kutuba in everyday conversation, and then people would, for instance, say, I strongly disagree. So you see the majority of our uh, interlocutors say, well, no, I, you know, I don't speak Shima Kutuba. Or some would disagree, someone would somewhat disagree, neither agree, disagree, not agree, all the way to agree, strongly agree. Right, so you already here you see the what we call language shift or language endangerment that most people uh, strongly disagree or disagree to the um, idea that they would speak, that would be able to speak uh, the local language in everyday conversation. And what we do on basis of such questions, we had several of them, is to define speaker types. So people, for instance, would say, well, I strongly disagree or disagree, we put into a Japanese monolingual category. Those who say somewhat uh, disagree to somewhat agree are what we call passive bilinguals. So many um, Okinawans of my generation, so you know, people in their 50s, early 60s, also 40s, sometimes even 30s, have been exposed a lot to Okinawan, and so they are able to understand it. There's basically a third of the population in Okinawa is able to understand Okinawan, but have never learned to use it productively. So they can understand, but not use it. So these are what we call the passive bilinguals. And then we have, um, we call them full or uh, rusty bilingual uh, speakers. The full speakers are those who are also, who are able to speak the Okinawan language in all situations. And that includes like, for instance, honorific language. Whereas rusty speakers usually don't have the honorifics, uh, but they're totally able to uh, have, you know, long conversations in Okinawan. So we distinguished um, on the basis of these questions, uh, three types of speakers, and that is the independent variable, right? So that would be the cause. So we look, you know, Japanese monolinguals, passive bilinguals, bilinguals, is the interrelation with happiness. So in order to do that, we have to ask questions on how happy they are. Um, this is one of them. We asked many questions. So uh, the question is, please imagine a letter with steps numbered from zero at the bottom to 10 uh, at the top. The top of the letter represents the best possible life for you. And the bottom of the letter represents the worst possible life for you. On which step of the letter would you say you personally feel you stand at this time? So take 10 seconds and think how satisfied with your life are you at this current point in your life from zero to 10? I myself to reveal, I think I'm eight. So I'm a, I'm a rather happy person. Uh, this is the result we got from uh, people in Yomitan. So you see uh, people in Yomitan village, uh, lots of happy people there, right? Lots of people, 10, but most are five, then seven, six, eight. So that's very, very typical. You have some people are fundamentally very deeply unhappy. You see this here as well. Okay. So um, we use this question because this question is used every year in a Gallup survey on um, national happiness. Um, and it's just been published a month ago. And as every year we find out that the Finnish are the happiest people um, in the world, right? Here is um, the results from the happiness uh, report in 2024. You see Finland in average reports 7.74. So Finnish people are very, very happy. Um, so lots of things going well in their country. Uh, you see the United States 23rd, that's pretty good, but um, Americans have been slipping in the recent years. So things um, have not been going um, very well in the last five, six years um, in America. So life satisfaction is decreasing. Uh, there you see us very close now to Germany, right? Uh, Japan is up here, you see. The Japanese people, I'm afraid, are not very happy, nor are the South Korean for those who study, which is a bit of a miracle because they have good education system, they're healthy, a good economy, you know, uh, lack of corruption and so on. So, you know, these countries are doing fairly well, but they're not tremendously happy. They should be happier if you want. So now the question is, where are our informants in Yomitan village, right? If Yomitan was, um, was a country, where would they be? 
we find out that uh, the monolingual and the passive bilinguals are right up with the rest of Japan, 6.1. But, um, and this was, um, I was very glad to see that, Okinawan speakers, those who speak the language, are visibly happier um, than the rest of Japan. So uh, Japan in general is 6.06, um, Yomitani 6.1. Uh, the monolinguals, the passive bilinguals, uh, 6.1, Okinawan speakers, 6.7, they're as happy as the French, um, if you want. So that was um, a huge relief because lots of money went into that research. And if there weren't a difference, um, you know, I would have to bury uh, all my data and never mention this survey again. So here are um, the results that we have, Okinawan speakers 6.67, passive bilingual, monolinguals, we don't have much difference and this is very, very interesting. And I'm currently uh, working on that. Um, below these are the chi-square uh, rates. So you see that we have a very robust finding for um, Okinawan speakers. So the question is, why are there these difference? And this is how research works. Once you understand something, uh, you know, you're confronted with new problems. So what makes Okinawan speakers uh, passive bilinguals and monolinguals? And in particular, uh, why are passive bilinguals not happier than the monolinguals, right? This is what we would um, expect here. And um, I'm currently thinking that in, in, in my discipline, in social linguistics, we uh, tend to look at language as a resource so that language can be employed to do something right. You can have access to knowledge, uh, you can claim an identity, um, you can climb the social ladder, you could emigrate. So language is a resource to do something. Um, and whether this idea of language as a resource is very helpful to look um, at this, because if language were a resource, then the passive bilinguals are obviously more resourceful than the, um, than the monolinguals, but they show no difference here. And I um, am and I'm looking into uh, my data um, that um, speaking the language um, allows people to engage uh, more with the local community. And it's this engagement, this full engagement, where you not only receive, but we can also engage into it, where it's a give and take. That is this which provides uh, for higher rates of um, life satisfaction. Right. This is what we measured with Cantrell letter um, uh, instrument question. And if we look at other data, um, so there's lots of data that we collected. Um, you see that, for instance, um, between speaker types, again, right, monolinguals, uh, passive bilinguals, um, and full uh, bilinguals, so the speakers of Okinawan, um, you would always find um, that when it comes to village life, that the full speakers have much higher rates, um, um, report much higher rates in these questions that we asked. So all of these questions were on a Likert scale of one to seven. So when we ask, for instance, you know, do you value communicate in uh, participate in community activities where one would be never and seven would be very frequently right you would find you know uh, full speakers so 4.8 passive bilinguals slowly dropping and monolinguals uh, lower right but also like in yomitan people help each other you'd see full speakers reporting much higher rates here right most of my friends are in yomitan much higher rates among the full speakers and it's slowly decreasing. So rather than looking at a resource to do things, it allows you to take part in something. It, it, it enhances the intensity of uh, being um, um, a Yomitan villager um, if you want it. And it's this which makes uh, people um, happier and contributes to their uh, life satisfaction. So there is, uh, I've published already two papers on that with some of my research associates, if you're interested in that. Um, they were mentioned before on the slide, or just contact me by email and I can point out where that is. Um, I would like to conclude this presentation, not so much by um, 
be, you know, uh, drawing conclusions because I was just trying to familiarize you with the Lucas and um, how we look at diversity and how diversity is constituted, but with some resources where you can learn more about it. So um, we just um, edited a special issue on language and decolonization in the UQs where you can find that where you can of the people I mentioned, like Heis van der Lubbe, Matt Topping, uh, Maduka, uh, Hamine, uh, and, and many other um, people. So uh, have a look at that. That's uh, open access. <clears throat> There's also a very important NGO, which promotes uh, language transmission maintenance, Okinawa hands-on. Look at their activities. It's, it's very inspiring um, uh, what they are doing. There's also a Rukyun Heritage Language Society, which meets annually and where you can find more information on uh, their activities. Um, there is a podcast on endangered languages by Martha Tsui Billins, who's another uh, young Rukyunist uh, um, teaching um, in, uh, in California, uh, the publications of Madhuka Hamine, whom I think is the leading scholar in everything on language reclamation, uh, decolonization of Rukyun language, so have a look at her. Uh, also the website of Satya Fujita Round, who's working on uh, Miyako, Miyako and language and uh, language reclamation, revitalization there. She's also very pragmatic, very much hands-on, developing teaching materials, running uh, video workshops with youth in order to transmit the language. And if uh, you're still not tired, you might also have a look at uh, my side where you find more uh, publications on this topic. And with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure to share um, these ideas with you.